Hey, everybody, Dave here. Excited to let you know that we've added a great show to the CyberWire Podcast Network. Check out Devo's new podcast, Cyber CEOs Decoded, hosted by their CEO, Mark Van Zadelhoff. Cyber CEOs Decoded will bring you CEO to CEO conversations with leaders from established security giants to up and coming disruptors. This insightful show explores what makes cyber CEOs tick and the lessons they've learned from building cyber companies and sharing stories of success and failure in an ever evolving technology landscape. Be sure to check it out. It's really important that we work to get more broadband services out to those who need them, and that's both unserved and underserved populations. And right now, we've got an unprecedented opportunity with these broadband funds to do just that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. Today, Ben looks at content moderation in the EU. I've got the story of the White House limiting the DOD's offensive cyber operations. And later in the show, my conversation with Lauren Van Weser from Akamai, we're going to be talking about the implications of the Biden administration's executive order on cybersecurity. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And now, a few thoughts from our sponsors at Collide. Collide sends employees important, timely, and relevant security recommendations for their Linux, Mac, and Windows devices right inside Slack. Collide is an alternative to the old-school lockdown model of device management that ends up driving employees to use their personal devices. Instead of rendering your laptops useless, Collide takes a different approach where it teaches employees how to secure their systems and solve important compliance issues right in Slack. Visit collide.com slash caveat to sign up today. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash caveat. All right, Ben, we've got some good stories to share this week. Why don't you start things off for us here? So mine comes from Ryan Brown over at CNBC, uh, and it's entitled, EU Agrees on Landmark Law Aimed at Forcing Big Tech Firms to Tackle Illegal Content. Hmm. This is about a new uh, digital regulation that was agreed to by officials in the European Union over this past weekend, Hmm. and would force our favorite tech giants, Google, Meta, Twitter, and others, to better police illegal content on their platforms uh, or else risk multi-billion dollar fines. It's hmm. something like 6% of their annual revenue, which is, you know, pretty significant. The, uh, Euro- the Europeans really like to come at things with percentage of revenue fines, don't they? I mean, yes, that's they baked sure into do. GDPR. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of interesting parallels with GDPR here that I'm going to talk about. Okay. I, I see this as sort of a um, the ugly cousin of GDPR. <laughs> okay. uh, and I think it's going to be, it's going to, the, way it's going to carry out in the United States might be a little distinct than what we saw with uh, GDP, GDPR, but there are a lot of similarities. Okay. So first, what does this new uh, regulation do? This would limit uh, how digital giants target users with online advertisements. So the regulations would stop platforms from targeting users with algorithm using data based on things like gender, race, religion, immutable characteristics. You won't be able to target children uh, with targeted advertising. It would ban dark patterns, so any tactics designed to push people towards services and products Mm. um, that are not on the up and up are Mm going to be banned as part of this uh, regulation. And then, perhaps most controversially, tech companies are going to be required to institute procedures to take down illegal material, including things like hate speech, incitement to terrorism, and child sexual abuse. Hmm. Uh, I think that is going to be the most difficult thing for U.S. authorities and U.S. companies to grapple with. Hmm. What we saw with GDPR is the EU put in these regulations, and the tech companies decided— If we're going to have to go through hoops to comply with these regulations for our European user base, we might as well just institute these as general practices. So back Mm. in 2018, 2019, we all got emails saying our terms of service have changed. Uh, 
to comply with the GDPR. Right. Uh, I probably got hundreds of those emails. <laughs> I think it was easier for the tech companies to just say, let's comply with these regulations uh, and not have two separate regulatory regimes in the United States and in the European Union. Right. When we're talking about things like censoring illegal material, things like hate speech and incitement to terrorism, I think our values in the United States and our legal system uh, makes it a little more difficult to apply that provision within the United States. Mm. I think we have more of a, cu- a culture that prizes the uh, that prizes the marketplace of ideas, controversial opinions, and categorizing certain things as hate speech might be more offensive to the U.S. user base than it would be to our European counterparts. Hmm. And so this might be something where if we were to just adopt these new digital service regulations in the United States, there might be an uproar that these terms are censoring too much, particularly political content. Hmm. And I think it's really interesting that this regulation was agreed to the same general period that Elon Musk purchased Twitter. Uh, Hmm, Okay. I know. I'm I'm, going to get there. I'm (laughs) drawing the connection. I'm waiting for you to connect those dots. (laughs) So his big objection to Twitter seemingly, and I frankly don't exactly understand why he's purchasing it and and what his goals are. Right. Uh, But he's talked about wanting to foster a platform – that is absolutist in its stance on free speech. Mm. Uh, And he is, I think, against excessive content moderation, particularly things like shadow banning people based on their political ideology. Okay. And I think that kind of goes against the spirit of what this Digital Services Act in the European Union would be doing to entities like Twitter where they would actually be moderating more content. Hmm. Uh, So I think we're going to see this clash of values. Uh, This regulation, and I think particularly people on the left side of the political spectrum in the United States, think that there's too much hate speech, too much incitement to terrorism, that big social media platforms played a large role, for example, in the January 6th events, Hmm. and that we need stricter content moderation to make these platforms more tolerable, to keep everybody safe. The other side of the ledger, uh, represented by people like Elon Musk, is that we need to have uh, reasonable content moderation that fosters the greatest exchange of ideas, um, that fosters the greatest extent of of free speech as humanly possible. Uh, I'm not sure if the Elon Musk vision is achievable in practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's going to happen is if you don't do enough content moderation, your site is going to be overrun with bots and uh, neo-Nazis and other undesirable people. Right. I mean, does, has, I mean, that's the way it's played out. We, we've, we've, we've been through this before, right? I mean, right. So is this a fool's errand to think is, – is it just rhetoric to say I'm coming in and I'm going to be the one who, who supports free speech? Because it seems like every time that happens – you know, folks come in and they say that, and then the reality sets in, and they're like, well, actually, you know what? This isn't going to be a viable commercial uh, entity if we just let everybody out here with their megaphones sh- shout at each other. Right. So I, this is what I wonder about the whole Elon Musk thing. Yeah. Is he doing this because he thinks he can make Twitter profitable, and he thinks that there would be a better business model and being more open to different types of speech including some speech that would have been curtailed under the previous Twitter regime. Okay. Or is he doing this as some sort of ideological play where he's actually willing to lose money but believes so strongly in the idea of an unregulated platform or a platform where content moderation is extremely minimal and is limited to direct threats of violence, things like that. Hmm. Uh, And I think you know there are certain things that – Certain actions he could take, one of them being letting President Trump back on Twitter, and then a couple of the other famous, notorious accounts that have been permanently uh, banned on Twitter, letting those back, it would be a signal that he's really doing this for ideological purposes, even if it would not be a viable business model. Mm -hmm. And unlike the other 7 billion people in the world, it might not be that big of a deal to him to lose – billions of dollars if this is an ideological project that he cares about. Hmm. 
Uh, so it, I just thought, in the meantime, ruins Twitter for the rest of us. <laughs> well, that's certainly my worry. I mean, although I suppose some people <clears throat> could say finally allows Twitter to realize its great potential, right? And that seems to be the view of even people like Jack Dorsey, who tweeted yesterday yeah. uh, as we're recording this. We're going to let Twitter flourish. Twitter is going to um, take off to the stars. It's going to be this free speech platform. We are absolutist in our position on free speech. I think what we see in this European Union law is the countervailing force is unfettered free speech leads to hate speech, incitements to violence, and various forms of deranged, psychotic, pornographic material. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I, I think we're starting kind of a it's not yet a hot war. It's more like a cold war of opposing sides on the content moderation divide between mm-hmm. the Elon Musks of the world who think that we're moderating content too much and entities like the European Union uh, who has really taken the lead in fighting big tech companies uh, in trying to prevent these services from being detrimental to society writ large. Uh, so I just thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition and in that it – happen kind of around the same time. Yeah. I think another aspect of this that fascinates me just with the whole Elon Musk buying Twitter thing is just that we are at this place where we have this billionaire class who can buy things up this way. and As so, a vanity project. Right. And, and so you look at Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post yep. and you have Elon Musk buying Twitter. So you have this – you know, a small number of people who have a large amount of control over many of the primary ways in which information is distributed today. It's not like it used to be. You know, owning a newspaper is not, uh, you know, it, you can't compare owning a, a newspaper to owning Facebook or right, Twitter. Right. Or, you know, it's, just, it's a different, another, it's it's another uh, level of magnitude of, of uh, reach, I suppose, is a good way to say Now, it. in fairness, it's not like Twitter was a, was a company, it was like a co-op that you'd see in Park Slope in Brooklyn uh, owned by its users. I mean, it, it right. was a publicly traded company, right. but it still had a top-down structure, uh, structure and some of the major investors were eccentric billionaires. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly somebody like Mark Zuckerberg controlling Facebook is another example of a billionaire with a lot of decision-making power. Mm-hmm. I think what some of the Elon Musk boosters are saying now that he's bought Twitter is, we're just transferring control from a billionaire class that doesn't believe in free speech to a billionaire class that does believe in free speech. So <laughs> the the constant is having an eccentric billionaire at the head of the company. <laughs> right. Now we have someone that's supportive of free speech. Uh-huh. The broader thing that I think you're bringing up is, is it good at all to have billionaires be in control of the main arteries of communication? Mm-hmm. Um, people Globally. Who have, Globally. Right. Yeah, people who might frankly have their own parochial interests, uh, and that's true at any side of the ideological spectrum. Whether right. it's Bezos at the Washington Post um, promoting his own business interests in Amazon and Whole Foods, or if it's Elon Musk and his ideology maybe making its way into some of the content moderation decisions he and his people are going to make at Twitter. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's particularly healthy. Uh, I don't know what the solution is. So the thought is maybe we do what Justice Thomas has argued in a recent Supreme Court dissent that we start to look at these entities like common carriers Mm -hmm. and we allow for increased federal regulation on these sort of content moderation practices. That itself is extremely problematic in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think (laughs) – That pesky First Amendment. I know. (laughs) Really, we're at a position where – I'm not sure this is exactly the right term, but these companies are too big to fail. Uh, Yeah. We need to make them as successful as possible. Too big to fail or or too big to be the playthings of individuals. Right. Too too big to be vanity projects of – people who think that they have a brilliant idea of how to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess the question is, is this going to be like 
Tesla? Or is this going to be like one of those weird Hyperloop tunnel projects that's gone nowhere? <laughs> and I guess well, that remains to be seen. Well, are these guys with their, their spaceships, right? Right. I mean, the, you know, their van- let's go into low Earth orbit together. Yay, we. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I suppose— um, Look, wealthy people can spend their wealth on whatever they want. Apparently, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I guess it gives me pause when you when when you see uh, public policy enable the this amount of accumulation of wealth. Um, that mm, I, I have a problem with that. I have no problem with rich people, but when it gets to this point, I think perhaps we've got a public policy failure here. That's and that's my. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know that's not necessarily a popular opinion, but I, 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 I submit it's bearing out that it can be problematic. Let me just state for the record to our new Twitter overlords: I don't agree with Dave Bittner. <laughs> Do not kick me off your your platform. I see. Okay. I love our eccentric billionaires. This is They're how it's going to go. This is how it's going to play out, huh, Ben? So I think so. I mean, so you, Twitter's more important to you than me. I understand. I okay. I just I just, I know where I stand now. It's if you fine. happen to see me complimenting it's SpaceX, <laughs> it's fine on my Twitter yep. profile. Yep. Then you know you might have an idea of what I'm up to. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, we'll have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, my story this week, this comes from the Wall Street Journal. It's actually an opinion piece uh, written by uh, Jacqueline Schneider. Uh, she is uh, a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, and this is, uh, it's titled, uh, The Biden White House's Cyber Warfare Power Grab. Um, and... It's interesting to me from a, a couple of perspectives. So first, let me unpack what what uh, the case that she's making here is that uh, back during the Obama administration, President Obama had a policy directive which kind of centralized the interagency review process for offensive cyber operations. OK, so offensive cyber operations are when uh, our Department of Defense, our intelligence community – uh, rather than being reactive, they are proactive and they go and do things in the cyber realm that they, uh, they are to our national defense or um, strategic interests and they go out and do them. Um, evidently, during the Obama, Obama administration, um, the systems that they put in place were by some accounts um, – took a lot of effort to get things through, right? Interagency uh, review processes. Bureaucratic squabbles. Yes, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. So when President Trump took the reins, um, evidently he streamlined this. Uh, and uh, he had uh, National Security Presidential Memorandum 13, which according to this uh, piece is classified, but public statements uh, say that it allowed the folks in the Department of Defense to conduct what they call time-sensitive offensive cyber operations by sidestepping this interagency approval process. Right. So if, if they needed to, they could go and do the things they needed to do without having to go through all of this rigmarole. Um, now with uh, President Biden in office, evidently he is looking to roll back to – the way things were dur- during the Obama administration, slowing things down again. Um, I'm curious what your take on this is, Ben, because on, on the one hand, I have to wonder, you know, ha- to what degree is this um, just sort of partisan stuff where Obama had one way of doing things, Trump came in and changed it, Biden's going to change it back to the way that Obama had it just because he can, <laughs> or uh, is there actually – a legitimate policy reason that the Biden administration could see to slow this down. Could they perhaps think could, the things that they know that we don't know because a lot of the stuff is classified? Is it possible that they've looked at this and said, yeah, you know what? Uh, perhaps things were happening a little too fast. I think this is more of an ideological difference of views than a partisan one. Mm. I mean, I think generally Democratic administrations, and this isn't just uh, true as it relates to defense policy, wants more layers of interagency oversight over everything. Mm. Um, So there's going to be a more centralized bureaucratic review of federal – all federal regulations, uh, for example – in Republican administrations, particularly as it relates to the Department of Defense and military operations, 
you don't want all of these additional bureaucratic hurdles and you want to give more authority to people to take action when necessary. I mean, this is kind of George W. Bush war on uh, war on terror mentality. Hmm. We don't want to hamstrung our uh, defense apparatus, our generals uh, who are on the ground to understand these operations. We don't want them to be hamstrung by a burdensome review process. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that either side in this dispute uh, is necessarily right or wrong. I think it's just in a different approach uh, approach to cyber operations. What this uh, author is saying, the author of this op-ed, is the Trump policy gives the Pentagon free reign to conduct whatever cyber operations it deems useful, and that's problematic. Hmm. But what she's saying is in the time that that regulation has been in place, there's not that much evidence that the U.S. is engaging in all kinds of offensive cyber operations. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not the case that the Defense Department is acting – brashly or out of turn in getting us wrapped up in cyber conflict. And in fact, that's just not how cyber conflict has played out over the past several years. Hmm. It hasn't been used uh, as an offensive weapon in a way that would cause more kinetic military activity. It's right. Been used it hasn't for, led to escalation. Right. It's yeah. been used for things like surveillance, espionage, creating mm-hmm. a, a general fog, social media trolling, hacktivism. Uh, And I think for that reason, this author might say we don't need to be as worried about the Pentagon taking these actions without any oversight. What I might say is because this is not necessarily a purely Defense Department operation, this isn't something that's wholly a military operation, maybe we do want review from other agencies that have different expertise. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. So... Hmm. Whether that's uh, an entity like CISA, whether that's the State Department who understands how these things work diplomatically, um, or just people who have technical expertise. I mean, it might be useful as long as this is not solely a military operation. If we're doing things for the purpose of espionage, for the purpose of intelligence gathering, maybe it's better that other entities besides the Department of Defense get involved. But that's Mm. just my view. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's an interesting point. I mean, uh, as you say, uh, Ms. Schneider, who wrote this piece, points out that cyberspace isn't necessarily the Wild West anymore, that we we're seem to be settling into this mode where there are norms that are being developed. Um, And I think a lot of the fears that people had, you know, look at the the invasion of Ukraine. You know, we thought that perhaps the lights would be turned off or we wouldn't be able to pump our gas or, you know, all all sorts of uh, critical infrastructure things might happen. And they haven't. It hasn't played out that way. doesn't mean it couldn't in the future. Right. But so far, this is where we seem to be. Um, So, yeah, interesting. I I think it's a a good point she makes here. Um, It is kind of wonky, I guess. (laughs) It's sort of a subtle, subtle thing. Uh, you know, back, the back and forth between administrations kinds of, uh, I, I, I guess that part fascinates me that, you know, we, well, you did this and I did this and I'm, we're going to do this. And, and trust you know. me, this is not even close to the most extreme example of how these things work. Yeah. I mean, my favorite example is the House of Representatives cafeteria. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I, and I, this is going to sound fascinating, but in 2007, the Democrats took control of Congress. Speaker Pelosi came in and had this whole Green the Capital initiative. Okay. So all of the dishware in the House cafeteria was biodegradable. Uh, mm. It was environmentally friendly. Then Republicans took over the House in 2011 and styrofoam came back. Oh, interesting. We got styrofoam, <laughs> day one. Right, right. 2019, Speaker Pelosi comes back into power, and the biodegradable cups uh, made their return to the House cafeterias. Right, so right. it can get a lot more petty than defense policies. I mean, even something like the Mexico City policy, which is whether we provide foreign aid to organizations that promote uh, abortions overseas, that's something that when every new administration comes in on the first day, they reverse the previous administration's policy if they mm. disagreed with it. Right. So Republican administrations come in and reinstitute the Mexico City policy. Democratic uh, administrations come in and they rescind it. Right. So this is just part of the the back and forth of politics. Yeah. There's no point in, in gaining power if you're not going to put your ideological stamp on everything you do. Yeah. Whether that's 
cyber espionage or the house cafeteria dishware? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, when President Reagan came in and, and tore the solar panels yep, off the solar White House. solar panels are gone. <laughs> right, right. So, so the house cafeteria, soon you'll be uh, able to order yourself a, a baby seal burger, right? <laughs> right. If the Republicans win this fall, styrofoam's coming back. Right. Right. And uh, we'll just put those biodegradable cups uh, on the shelf uh, until the next time yes. the Democrats take power. Yes, petty differences at the mm-hmm. highest level, right? <laughs> All right, well, that is my story this week. Uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Again, that's from the Wall Street Journal, uh, written by Jacqueline G. Schneider. So let's return to our sponsor, Collide. Collide sends employees important, timely, and relevant security recommendations for their Linux, Mac, and Windows devices right inside Slack. Collide is perfect for organizations that care deeply about compliance and security, but don't want to get there by locking down devices to the point where they become unusable. Instead of frustrating your employees, Collide educates them about security and device management while directing them to fix important problems. You can try Collide with all its features on an unlimited number of devices for free for 14 days, no credit card required. Visit collide.com slash caveat to sign up today. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash caveat. Enter your email when prompted to receive your free Collide gift bundle after trial activation. All right, Ben, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Lauren Van Weyser. She is uh, from Akamai, and we were talking about some of the implications of the Biden administration's executive order on cybersecurity. Here's my conversation with Lauren Van Weyser. So the National Telecommunications and Information Administration is the agency in a, uh, that advises the president on telecommunications, internet, and broadband policy writ large. It sits in the Department of Commerce, uh, so it's an agency contained within the Department of Commerce. And this is an advisory organization? Do they have any regulatory function there? Oh, yes, absolutely. So they've got, obviously, a a key role in uh, broadband deployment, broadband policy, um, but also they manage the federal uh, airwaves for spectrum, so radio spectrum use as well. So they have put out a request for comment on uh, implementation of some of the broadband funding programs that have been established in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act from the Biden administration. I know you and your colleagues at Akamai uh, have some opinions on this uh, and see this as uh, an opportunity here. Oh, absolutely. So um, uh, what's fun for me is being able to engage on this issue is really a marriage of my background in both broadband policy, but also cybersecurity. It's really important that we work to get more broadband services out to those who need them, and that's both unserved and underserved populations. And it's really important uh, that we're smart about how we do that. And right now, we've got an unprecedented opportunity with these broadband funds to do just that. And how do you suppose this is going to play out? I mean, the the folks who are keeping an eye on this, how do they suspect this rollout, the ability to to take broadband to people who are underserved? What are the most likely ways that that's going to happen? Well, first off, just from a quick process overview perspective, the NTIA yeah. is going to come up with some broad criteria for these broadband deployments. And that's why it was seeking public comment on on the broadband infrastructure deployments. And then it will provide guidance to the states who will actually have the on the ground implementation in their respective states. And so it's going to be both a federal process and ultimately a state level process to help push these deployments out to where they need to be. So the NTIA is going to set broad criteria, 
for uh, these federal funds, and then the states are going to do some criteria and prioritizing on their end, and the states are actually going to be pushing that money out. And so what are some of the recommendations that you all have made here? It's really important. I think the pandemic was very instructive in terms of accelerating services, online services. So more and more people need to have trust in those services. And so these broadband deployments really need to have cybersecurity baked in from the front end. And that sounds, you know, especially to your audience who's so savvy in cybersecurity, like, oh, wow, you know, this is this is just like what we say. Don't bolt on cybersecurity solutions, imbue them into the DNA. But in the broadband infrastructure space and policy, that is new. And, uh, cybersecurity really hadn't been front and center. And you know, what the pandemic taught us was you've got to ensure there's a foundation for trust in these online services. If I'm doing banking, if I'm doing healthcare. And so we need to be thinking about cybersecurity from the front end, particularly with greenfield deployment. So people getting access to broadband services for the first time and wanting to encourage businesses to develop in those places really need access to baseline cybersecurity services. So that's how we've weighed in as, as Akamai in this formal proceeding. NTIA, please put these in on the front end. Think about these issues. It's becoming increasingly important with the types of services consumers are using online, like healthcare, banking, et cetera. It's really important that they be able to have a level of trust in their online experience. I think everyone uh, would agree with that as, as an aspirational goal. Do you have any practical elements that you could share, actual examples of how something like this could be implemented? Absolutely. So uh, just uh, traditionally in the broadband space, the FCC, NTIA looked at issues like just access. Do I have access to the to the broadband pipe? And also speed. What are the speeds that are available to me? And so mm. this would be um, asking for you know, best practices to be referenced in. You know, maybe it's NIST guidelines, maybe it's other guidelines, so that, for example, anti-phishing and, and malware protection could be baked into the services that are deployed to people receiving broadband services for the first time. Yeah, I mean, that really is a, a kind of a, a change in the way we approach this, right? I mean, I think most people have thought about those things and relied on, I don't know, downstream service provider. You know, I tr if I have Gmail, I trust them to do my spam filtering and so on. But what we're advocating here is having more of those sorts of things really baked into the fundamental level of the network access? Both, actually. Fundamental level of network access, but also... You know, some of the broadband won't be for pipes themselves. Uh, some of the funds will be for actual devices, et cetera. So it's thinking about making sure that the folks we're bringing online for the first time have access to those services. I mean, what we want is for businesses in rural places to be able to grow and develop uh, with access to the same level of digital experience and confidence in that digital experience as as those in metropolitan areas. Has there been any pushback uh, against this sort of notion? Are there providers or installers who say this is going to be you know, a regulatory burden that they're not prepared to take on? Well, there was generally support for our position and the comments that were filed, just so folks know, these, these comments are, are public. The proceeding is public, so you can have access to all of those comments. So there's there's general support. I think, as with anything else, there's a tension between you know, how prescriptive you are as a regulatory body and you know, how much flexibility there is in terms of deployments on the ground. And so you want to have flexibility in terms of the actual technologies that are used, to accommodate um, and tailor to local situations, but at the same time saying that as, as NTIA is saying that, you know, cybersecurity needs to be baked in from the front end is a big change from 
the way it's been done historically. So I think there is a balancing act. The way you're alluding to it is, is certainly the case, but it's important that we don't simply measure access to broadband as it's been done historically as geographic access. It, you've got to have effective access to broadband. And so therefore, we've got to be smart about how we deploy these federal dollars. And what sort of timeline are we on from this point forward? When, when do you suppose we'll actually see communities seeing the benefits of this? Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, you know, I would hope Soon, it's going to take some time. Uh, you know, when you have a public process like this, I would expect NTIA to be issuing guidelines in the spring. States need to come up with their individual plans. Obviously, they know the areas that they need to target, places where they don't have enough deployments now. And so I would expect, you know, maybe a year and a half to two years uh, timeline before if if I'm in a community that doesn't have broadband today, then I might possibly receive it. And I think part of it depends on the nature of the technology. Certainly, certain wireless technologies are much faster in terms of implementation than, uh, than other types of technologies, you know, where you have to uh, go dig and, you know, put fiber into the ground. And so I think, you know, the timeline also depends on the nature of the technologies that are deployed. Are we at the point where there's... Um an issue with the fact that, as you mentioned, you know, a public process like this takes a certain amount of time, and yet um, the rate of change in technology is fast and and always seems to be accelerating. Is it possible those two things get a little out of sync? Well, you know, sometimes that happens, but I think because technology and it's you know known that technology keeps evolving that it's really important to have forward interoperability. So even if I were thinking, I mean, I, I've been in the broadband area, I, I hate to even say it, and, you know, we were talking 2G, and now we're talking, you know, beyond 5G. And so the key is ensuring that technologies are deployed in a forward, forwardly interoperable way so that if I, if the technologies have changed, I can deploy the newest at the time that I'm doing the actual deployment. So I think it's important that the plans that the states develop have flexibility for that and that there's a general awareness of let's go this way because we can, whatever generation of technology, we can deploy the next if we need to. So I think it's important consideration to keep in mind, but it's something that isn't new to um, you know, the proceeding we're in now. All right, Ben, what do you think? First of all, we need to crown the Dave Bittner proposal in the cybersecurity executive order for the NTSB uh, cyber incident review. That's something that you've been pushing for for years. <laughs> the fact that she's mentioned it uh, just really jumped off the page to me. I think you need to get more credit here. Uh, okay, yes, yes. I, I'm quietly uh, t- pulling the levers and turning the dials, right? <laughs> yeah, you really control <laughs> the strings the on, on cyber mm-hmm. policy, so yes. congratulations well, on that. You, thank you very much. Thank it's, you. A, it's a really interesting interview. I mean, I think... Uh, Earlier in this episode, we talked about how the EU has taken the lead on things like data privacy, regulating content on social media. But the U.S. has really taken a lead on some of the things that are embedded in the cybersecurity executive order, governance issues, Mm. reporting requirements. Um, So it's kind of good to see that we're taking the lead in, in one realm here. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, our thanks to Lauren Van Weser for joining us. We do appreciate her taking the time. And, of course, we want to thank this week's sponsor, Collide. Learn more about how Collide can help employees with important security recommendations for their Linux, Mac, and Windows devices at collide.com slash caveat. And that is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. 
The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Thank you.